Let's continue that. Oh, we lost Rob. I guess he doesn't consent. Would anybody like to pray us in this morning? I would. Sure. Scott, go ahead if you're able. Thanks, Lord, for this morning that we could come together and uh, get into your word to uh, give us uh, your wisdom and guidance. Uh, open our hearts and minds to what you have to teach us this morning. And we thank you for all the guys who are here this morning and continue to be in our lives and guiding us, directing us, and be with those who could not be with us today. In your precious name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, we're thankful that, definitely thankful to God that we have who he wants or needs here today. Um, and each and every day, right? Every, every time we get together. <clears throat> well, did anybody have any revelation um, from last week's um, discussion? Hmm. We could uh, let the walls fall down. Okay, well, uh, having heard nothing, so we're moving our way around the, the relational diamond uh, in this book uh, from uh, the Promise Builders study series. It's an older uh, book, I think about 1993 uh, was when it was originally written. Um, and its title is Applying the Seven Promises. Um, so I think I shared, yeah, I shared in the, in the, in the app picture of the, the relational diamond, kind of looks like a baseball diamond. And so the first week, um, well, a few weeks ago, we, we talked about, I think it was No Man is an Island, uh, focused on promise two, a man and his friends. And so this, that was about um, building brotherhood and um and was uh, like stepping up the home plate and going to first base um, the equivalent of acquaintances uh, and accepting one another we said that it takes about uh eight to ten weeks i guess um in between each of the bases normally and um then last week when we talked about um let down the walls it was out of the second part of this book which is uh, equivalent to going from first to second base and there's some storming sometimes but we're trying to get to be friends and encouraging one another and then um, and let's see yeah that was let the walls fall down and this week we've been studying in the app already um so what's the big deal about church about the church and at the same time we're uh, in part three of the book, we're just taking one uh, study out of it, um, out of each part for this time. And um, this is this is equivalent to going to, to rounding second, uh, norming together, and getting to the point where we can exhort one another uh, and because we become brothers. Uh, <clears throat> and... Um, I think, you know, it felt like, well, I think uh, hopefully a lot of you feel this way as well. Um, that it felt like we were kind of like certainly acquaintances, almost friends when we started and on day one or two. And uh, we've been brothers for a while. And that's kind of why we're going through the various parts of the book, the various parts of the relational diamond to kind of see um, how each of the, the, the studies is handled from a, a perspective of how deep do we go, uh, you know, things like that. And, you know, the questions get a little less um, uh, objective questions and a little more subjective uh, in, our, in our thinking. They go a little deeper in how we think about Christ and how we think about, in this case, this week, the church. So this study this week is... Uh, built around promise five, a man and his church. 
And, um, you know, Jonathan, Jonathan was the one that was able to input the, the uh, questions, the, the initial response, warm up and things like that. And, and I thought he did an awesome job, much better than I've been doing. Um, his, I, I think iPhones have a little few more, few more features. Uh, so I thought that was awesome to see how it comes across with, um, with somebody else doing it. And I appreciate, I appreciate it having the, the time to uh, focus on, on the study um, a little bit more. So um, this week in our warm up, talk about um, in our high tech society, the church can be dismissed as a relic of the past or, no signif or of no significance. It's been, it's been, uh, it is seen as necessary only for a wedding site, a place to drop off the kids on Sunday morning, or for making a few business contacts. So why does the world fail to see the church for what it really is? And what do you think is the reputation of your church in your community? I think the church fails to see it for what it is because we have a huge, huge breakdown in men being patriarchs. Um, we got a great thing coming up this next weekend with Tony Evans, and I'm looking forward to that. And he talks about a broken man with a broken home and a broken church, right? Uh, he goes through the whole scenario. <clears throat> I think it has a lot to do with uh, just we need a revival, you know, to sweep through this nation because especially since COVID hit and people started zooming in the church, it's even separated so much more. Um, gives people a reason to say, well, I can stay at home this morning, you know, and just zoom it in. Uh, but God, God wanted us in that fellowship. He, we're, we are social creatures, and <sighs> staying at home and watching it on Zoom is is a better alternative to not having it. Uh, but I'll tell you, man, since I started being able to go back to just like my clean waters classes on Thursday night and have fellowship with the guys there and actually, you know, touch a human being and look in their face, it. Uh, there's just something there that can't be replaced by any of this other media stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that the church has, I don't know, in some ways fallen away also. Um, seems like it's gotten more like show business and about the money than it is about uh, the salvation of people's souls. Yes, I, I see that. Um, even in what we've been doing with the online streaming, you know, some churches started out, um, you know, really struggling. They couldn't get sound. They couldn't get the video right. They spent a lot of time getting the production right. And um, it, you know, that doesn't mean it didn't come across, uh, you know, as as genuine sermons eventually, and or well, it always was, but. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think, you know, sometimes some of these video uh, online uh, streaming sermons are almost like, uh, you know, just a huge production and, and a TV program anymore. Like, you know, Andy, uh, Charles Stanley is um, a, a pastor I've followed for a long time. I love his sermons, um, but it gets a little too commercialized sometimes. And, um, you can watch an hour version or you can watch a 30 minute version. I like the 30 minute version better because I just get the sermon, right? Um, yeah. Um, so the, uh, yeah, when the church, uh, the, the church today seems to be led by uh, fallible men and women. Mm -hmm. We've certainly seen a lot over the past um, 10, 20 years of, you know, pastors getting caught and churches just kind of going off in, in a different direction sometimes. And 
um, the you know one of the big things is the prosperity church. You know the the idea that we're only going to uh, preach about the goodness of God, and that's all good, right? God is good and He's good all the time, but He's also good in the bad times. And um, so, um, so hopefully today we're going to talk about what can we do to help with um, with that perception with that reality um and uh, you know what should we be doing right um <clears throat> yeah I, I, I do know that uh you know i've seen chris i've seen some of your posts and and i really agree with you that there's so many of the churches out there that are not number one they're they're actually not functioning as to what the church should be the church is supposed to be a place of healing and you know there's a lot of churches out there now that you can't take your problems to because they don't want to hear them they're so wrapped up in uh what's right for the world and what sounds good and what feels good uh, that's one reason i'm so blessed that god put me and my wife at the water of life church in fontana <laughs> there's a lot of broken people there and that's awesome and it's that's a mega, that is awesome, man. You know, it's a it's a mega church from you know the standards that they call it. They we have three different full blown services: one on uh, Saturday evening and two on Sunday. But it doesn't feel that way when you when you go in there. The people people are nice. People greet you. People want to genuinely know how you're doing. <laughs> my buddies uh, know, you know, and in, in my aspect of it when you come up to me on sunday morning and you ask me how i'm doing how i'm doing brother justice is going to tell you how he's doing um of course most of you guys know that too um <laughs> that's a, i think that's the biggest part of it right there is is the churches Family. aren't yes it, they're not functioning that way anymore they're they're not giving counsel to those that need counsel uh they're they're being more of what we call what the prosperity gospel you, you just, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I, I do this, I do that, I do this. Yeah, but, you know, how many people have you healed this week? How many people yeah. have come to you with their issues and you haven't turned them away? Got 12 so, people sitting on the pew, you know, six cup, six couples sitting on the pew, and none of them know each other. Exactly. And it's like they're just there checking that box that we were here on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> And one of you other brothers mentioned a, a key fact there, James. I think you said it yours. You know that you got you got the pastors up there, and, and they're falling. Uh, you know, I'm all in this conquer series right now, and and Ted Roberts gives a lot of good statistics on it. And right now, the the percentage is 58 percent. It's 58 percent of all pastors have a problem with pornography, and I mean that's 58 percent that will admit of the ones that they actually interviewed, you know, or questioned on it. So if, if we have that much hurt in our pastoral realm, then you can't expect the church to be right. It, it, it all boils down to us. It's us. Yeah. As, as men in the home, as us, as men in the church, what are we doing about it? You know, if, if our church is not functioning properly, what are we doing about it? Yeah, so... Right. Can I read you a short quote from a book I'm reading by Chuck Swindoll that's relevant? Yes. So the book is called Dropping Your Guard. It's about needing to have authentic relationships in the church, which is a great topic. And this week, uh, yesterday, Thursday, I read this chapter called Choose, Choose for Yourself, taken from Joshua 24. And in here, he's talking about the church losing, its, losing sight of the primary objective. And he says, ask around and see if people in the church know why your ministry exists. Don't be shocked if most of them shrug and say, oh, I don't know, to hear good preaching. The church is a body, and the body needs much more than just more and more food. The church is to be a training base. It is where God's family members are encouraged to grow, to learn, to exercise, to find rest and refreshment for facing life's realities. The church is a body of fellow strugglers who meet together and relate openly and honestly and freely. It's a place of prayer and quiet solitude, an anvil where ideas are hammered out and convictions take shape. It is a hospital for those in need of healing, a place where compassion, forgiveness, and grace are dispensed as readily and regularly as information. That's the big picture. 
it seems today that many of <clears throat> many churches have adopted some form of this as their mission statement. If you have life pretty much together, if your if your theology is nailed down and consistent with ours, if you're willing to give but not in need of receiving anything more than some sermon songs and superficial talk, then come join us. Hey, Amen. That, that that's the way it is. <laughs> that book is forty years old. You know, you need to be able to have a discussion in church and be able to go to your your church leaders to bring your problems to. And whenever a church leader, in my opinion, when they pick and choose the scripture or chop it up the way that they want it to be, that's not that's not being Christ-like. Yeah, I, I think. Go ahead, Kate. James. Sorry, sorry, Chris. Um, yeah, and I think maybe that's one thing that I like about these studies is, you know, we're not just, we're not just, um, we're not just spending this hour together. You know, uh, the other thing I think I, I'm noticing about the app is it is, it's keeping us uh, connected through the week, not just the hour that we're here together. So there's more that we can say together. We can do more life together. We can think our thoughts a little more fully, maybe. Um, so if somebody would look up Hebrews 10 and be ready to read 19 through 25, I'll read the background part here for this passage. Our Lord said in Matthew's gospel, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This suggests that the church is God's personal project and that it'll be perpetually invincible with all its quirks and weaknesses it still stands head and shoulders above all the other institutions recognizing its timeless importance the author of hebrews calls us to a fresh appreciation of the church's strategic place in our lives centering us in god's plan Somebody have uh, Hebrews 10? Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast our, the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You want me to read 25 too? Please, yes. Yeah, we need that one. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. There's, um, why do you think, why do we enthrone Jesus as the head of the church? Hmm. He instituted it. He created it. God put him there, right? Yeah. Um, And we're, and we're told, uh, I can't pull the reference out of my head, but um, we're told in many places that, that we're told that Christ is the head of the church, like even in places where husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. You know, we're given this picture of male headship is not a domineering headship, but it's a loving headship just as Christ loved the church, we're given this, this, this metaphor repeatedly um, that it's obvious. That, like, you, you know, you use a metaphor because it's an obvious example. So it was just obvious to Paul and to Paul's readers that, well, of course, you'll understand when I say your marriage, your husband-wife relationship, it should be like this other obvious thing, the relationship of Christ to the church. So, um the fact that people are confused about it, some people are confused about Christ's headship of the church today is 
it's not because it was so so hard to understand. It was used as the the simple side of a metaphor. I think uh, personally, the Holy Spirit told me to look because I reflected on that particular. I got stuck on that particular question and aspect of it uh, in a good way. Um, because one of the main reasons that we have Christ as the head of the church like that and put him in that position is in, in the old days, they used to have to approach the Holy of Holies with offerings. They had to kill animals. They had to go through certain rituals and rites and all this kind of stuff before they could even get close to God. But by having Christ at the head of our church, we, we don't have to do that anymore. We can approach the Holy of Holies through his son who came and died for us. We, we don't have that veil left. That veil was, was torn apart on the day of the crucifixion. So Christ being the head of our church puts us in a relationship with God that, that no other head of the church could because he is that pathway through the veil to our father. Yeah. I hate to throw out a possible detour, um, but something Carl just said about entering the Holy of Holies and having to bring a sacrifice. And and I, I think it's related. I'm gonna I'm gonna try James to tie it into the, the, the topic here that going rituals that were you know the verse we just read in Hebrews 10 talked about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But if we're not gathering together with that attitude of verse 24, the verse 24 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That the purpose of the gathering together isn't to feed me, it's for me to feed you. Amen. And, and I mean, sometimes I need to get fed, but even on days where I'm having a terrible, a terrible day, a terrible week, a terrible month, a terrible season, and Carl feeds me, there's a chance that there's somebody who's even worse off and even less sure of their place in Christ than I am. And I didn't need to feed them. And I've been slowly the last five weeks uh, reading and praying and studying through Isaiah. And I just read this in Isaiah 66 last night. And he's talking about um, true and false worship. And he's talking about that, um, that, um, uh, this is chapter 66, verse um, 2 and following. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor, poor, humble, and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. And then he contrasts it with the one who's not. He who kills a bull is, is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is as if he offers swine's blood. He's saying that if your sacrifices, if your worship are done with the wrong attitude, he says the sacrifice is like you committed murder. It's not, not only is it not acceptable to me, it's the opposite of acceptable. It's, yes. it's, it's an offense to me. It's not just, oh, well, you know, we read uh, Cain and Abel and, you know, Cain's, uh, Cain, uh, one sacrifice was acceptable and the other wasn't. It's not just not acceptable, it's an offense. And so to me, that ties into this Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 about um, when we gather, gathering with the right attitude. <clears throat> I've never yes. seen that before. Oh, your sacrifice is like murder. Yeah. So what are some of the other benefits of meeting together as a church? Anybody else? Apparently, for Jonathan, it's getting a good meal out of the deal. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, the just uh, being around someone, being in close proximity to them, the uh, you know the whole aura, electron stuff, and you you can walk and you can feel you can feel when someone feels good not even have to touch them you can get close to them and feel that they feel good or you can feel that they're in despair um it's keep because because the holy spirit that's in me is the same not not a different one but it's exactly the same holy spirit it's in you chris and you chris and you tom and you james and you dan it's the same holy spirit 
So when you get close to each other, you can feel that interaction. And, and when you assemble together, um, just it, it just magnifies it. Like some of you guys I know are, are kind of in the electronics industry, uh, such as I am, and I work a lot with frequencies. And when you get frequencies that are doing this, you know, they can, they can uh, beat against each other and, and cause the, the overall amplitude to be down. But then when the frequencies start coming together, your output power becomes higher and higher. And the more of the different ones that you have, and, it's, and it works the same way with us, the more spiritual beings that you get together, the greater the feeling there. And I believe the more healing power. So he wants us to assemble so that we can draw on each other. Yes, as, as physical fleshly human beings, but also to conglomerate his spirit, I believe. Um, yeah, in meeting together, we also do things like it uh, it suggests on these bases, right? We accept one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, and um, live life together. Um, <clears throat> why do a lot of Christians become negligent in their church life? Do you think? I have time oh, to do. I'm sorry. Become negligent in their in their church life. Yeah. yeah, my answer was because I don't have time to do it. <clears throat> so what are you spending your time on, right? Exactly. What are your priorities? Well, and that, I mean, that's really, when I hear somebody say something like that, it, the fact is, and I've said these words about other things, it's just not important to you you're not perceiving a value or either you're perceiving no value or no responsibility for it or both. And, and I'm using both of those because we're not just supposed to go to church because we get something out of it, but we have a responsibility to put into it. Like we were talking about before and we have, we get, we get a value out of the participation. And if we don't see either, then, we're just not gonna be committed. There's there's a scripture and I wish I could I wish I was that good, but I can't pull it out right now. But there's a scripture that tells us of a of a people entering through one gate and exiting through another. And that was a standard a standard operating procedure back in the old days of going into the synagogues and stuff into the cities going in one gate and going out another. Um, I remember our pastor, Dan, um, giving a sermon one time on that as, as the way we should be coming into church. We should be coming into church one way and leaving out another. In other words, regardless of whether it's for our healing or for someone else's healing, if we leave out of church the same way we came into church, then we've missed the whole We've, we've missed the whole ball of wax there. Uh, the, you, you should be able to pick something up by helping someone or by being helped. Um, I, I think the, we just get too stuck in, in ourselves. And, and, you know, like you said, we, we're not making time to do it. Or, I mean, we can make an ex a thousand excuses for why not to do something. And, and so it's, it's more like, what, what is it we need to do to get there, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Or it could be such a fact too. Some of us have been so broken by so many other people and so many other uh, religious factions or whatever that that you don't feel you don't feel welcome. You don't want to go anymore. So you just keep, but you keep trying sometimes. And that's when sometimes you have to walk in, see where you're at, uh, your facility, and try to find that right church. And on that topic, Dan, I just wanted to tell you publicly in this group, rather than in the chat, how encouraged I am by your boldness to stand for Christ and to, to, I say, to, man. to yeah. step out against With a very strong and powerful um, adversary. Yeah. That takes a lot of courage. I'm really proud of you. Yeah. And I would say that Amen. 
Yeah, I, I would say that um, thinking about this question about why people step away from the church or don't seem to continue to go, and this kind of goes into that in, in the secular world, you know, before you know Christ, and this was definitely my problem that I was hungry and I was looking for something and searching for something. And so in that aspect of things, you know, I went out and I sinned and I, it was never enough. I was never getting full. And whenever you go to the church, it needs to be, you need to be able to leave there receiving the bread, getting your daily bread and being full. And if you go to the church and you're not getting that bread, then you're not going to be full and you're going to step away from it. You're still searching. It's always a search. And if you can't, if you don't ever come to satisfaction and fullness, you're never going to be able to stay with it. Yeah, we've had we've had a lot of churches over the last 20 years or so, too. They're churches meant for searchers and seekers, right? But what is it beyond that? And um, I think a church has to, in um, in I also have for many years uh, taught leaders about the no man left behind model from man in the mirror and about these different they in there they categorize men in five different types and you know one is men that need christ which is the seekers and um or the those are the searchers uh maybe or maybe I, uh, anyway there, there are men that need christ and it's all about them and then there's men who are like uh, cultural Christians and CEO Christians, they come on church Easter and other, right? So, um, and then there's, and then there's, and these are, as you walk along a spiritual journey with Jesus, um, you know, hopefully at some point men are touched and they get to become biblical Christians where, you know, they can, they'll do studies, they'll do small groups, they'll do uh, things, uh, but, it, uh, and it's about more about God than about them. And then, uh, a fourth kind uh, a category is leaders where it's really about others and um, not what they get out of church, but what they're giving into other people uh, through their activities in the church. And then the fifth type of man is hurting men. And that goes across all those other categories because uh, even leaders uh, are, are hurting uh, often uh, and need, need help. So um, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Chris, about the Christopher about the getting what you need, and I I pray that men, you know, I think that's one of the things that the church is negligent about, and that that causes men to become negligent about being a part of a church or church life is that they're not getting what they need. So many so many men I I've seen over the years, um, you know, when I started when I first uh, moved to Maryland and we went to this. Uh, church that I'm going to now still um you know I see you know there were lots of kids you know kids middle school age and younger the kids the ones that go to the children's sermon right or the children's out time up in front of the church and so we built a whole new wing I mean we pretty much doubled the size of the church um and and we built an education wing because we didn't have anything but two or, you know three rooms where you could have Sunday school before that um, and we became, you know, we talked about um, uh, Willow Creek and how they, uh, uh, Bill, Bill Donahue, Bob Donahue, uh, but um, uh, Bill Bright um, had, had created a church of small groups, right? And I know there's some negative, negative stuff in, uh, that's come out lately about Bill, but he's, he's a man. And um, we pray, pray about that. Um, for our pastors in, in general, but um, but I guess it's a long story to where I was going with this is that the the family seemed even in my church how great I thought it, think it is um, is you know the kids would eventually you know with all that extra education wing and stuff they would, we would get them through confirmation and then you wouldn't see the fathers anymore. Love a man to Christ until he can love a man to Christ. Yeah, and a lot of times the, the wife wouldn't come be coming to church either because yeah, you know the man's not coming to church, so why do I, should I get up on Sunday morning either? 
Mm-hmm. And the kids, you know, they kind of drop out and they don't, they maybe go to college or go into the workplace and they don't really come back uh, into the church, at least for quite a while. Uh, you hope that you built enough into them as a church that they'll come back. But uh, a lot of men don't come back until they have kids of their own and they want to bring them to church. And so how do we bridge that gap um, between that time when and fill those needs? How does the church do that? And I think that's what Promise Keepers uh, yeah. started to do. Um, we did it very well for a while, but um, in the last 20 years, it's dropped off again because um, we got a little too thin and we got ahead of the Holy Spirit and whatever else ha- happened with Promise Keepers. So I'm praying that we're able to touch men's hearts again, um, you know, especially this year when we can actually come together and meet together. And I think it needs to be interesting for men, for them to be engaged. You know, it's, you're right, it should be about going to churches about, you know, serving him, serving the Lord, worshiping him. But in the same instance, you know, how can you love a man to Christ until he's ready to love another man to Christ is he ever done being loved to Christ? He's got to be constantly fed. He's got to, you know, it's, it's not a, all right, you're done. Just like what you were saying about once the kids were, had gone through confirmation, the dads quit coming, right? Well, he was just doing it because of his kids, right? Trying to do the right thing. And Mm -hmm. And then he fell away because that was all, that's the only reason why he was doing it. It was an inconvenience for him to be going to church in the beginning, you know, from the start, he was just going because of his kids. So there has to be more engagement to keep men interested and they have to be told what it says. It's not, it's not a, there's not a checklist that you go and you check it off and you're done. Once you finish the checklist that our relationship with Christ rose every day. And that's what we need to, that's the way that these men need to be engaged and be told is it's not, you're not done. You know, somebody comes in and asks you, how long is this going to take? How long do you have? Right. That's the answer. How long do you have the rest of your life is the answer to that question. Right. Because that that's the salvation that, you know, that's what we're looking for is, And it's about storing up treasure in heaven, not here on earth, right? So that's what we'll be judged for in the end. Go ahead, Carl. All right. I was going to say, you hit a really good point right there. There's so many people that think that uh, in their their brokenness, that when they decide that they don't want to be broken anymore, that it's going to be fixed today. And that's that's just not the way it works. The rest of your (laughs) life, brother. We're still... (laughs) Well, maybe especially us men. But tomorrow there will be something else, you know. <laughs> well, God, God said that, you know, look, I've washed you of your sins. I've forgotten about them, but it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences that you're going to have to deal with in the secular fleshly world for the mm-hmm. things that you've done. You're going to have to deal with that for the probably maybe for the rest of your life. You know, we can all pray and hope that we can get past those things. But the ultimate thing is just to know that, you know, I mean, I think that there's a lot of guilt that comes to and what a lot of men need to be told as well is you're not a bad person. You're just a person that has done bad things because that's what God told me. That's right. Told me that he loved me. I, when I asked him, how could he, how can you love me? I'm such a bad person. And that's exactly what he told me. He says, you're not a bad person. You're just a person who has done bad things. And that just changed my whole heart, allowed me to see things from a different perspective. And it's, I just wish that more men were open to being willing to give that testimony and just be completely broken and just dump it all out there. Quit living in that fear of of shame and just get it out there and, oh, it changes your life. It does. Yeah, and that right there is the perspective that we don't get anywhere else. The government isn't going to tell you you're good um, in a workplace. You're always having to perform and you're getting graded on that uh, and you're um, rated on that, whatever. And 
in you know even in your community you know men are just not respected so church is or is supposed to give that perspective uh that you don't get anywhere else give me the, let me tell you this that i saw last night on the news um oh that woman that films that whole george floyd thing right i don't know if any of y'all saw this but she was she's been given an honor i think by the nobel nobel uh, laureate group hmm. for filming that hmm. and i'm sitting here thinking you know the person that you know and i didn't see any of this happen but you know what would what would you have done in that situation if you were there i know what i would have done i would have been going to jail with george floyd because i would have tackled that cop off the top of him you know where's that person instead of giving the person i think that all those people that film that are just as culpable as the cop because they sat there and filmed it and, and let it happen you know i mean we got to start looking at things from a different perspective. And now these people are given that, given her an award for that. And I'm thinking to myself, what is that telling the rest of society? Just film it. Don't get involved. Yeah. That's not, that's not Christ. So what, what issues of life was the church uniquely gifted to handle? Where am I going when I die? Nobody else has an answer for that. <laughs> Amen. The, Everybody the, is every every issue. Every I issue. I say the church should be equipped to handle every issue. We have the ex we have the instruction book for everything right here. The best book you can find on any aspect of life. Um, but you know. I don't know the I don't know the percentage of that, but there's so many churches, and I'll say at least half of them, if if not a whole lot more than that, that won't even teach about the Holy Spirit anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that they're they're not utilizing the things that God's given them in order to to heal the multitude of sins that we have. It says in you know in the Psalms, you know, there's a multitude of sins, um, and, and you know we don't. A lot of us that have addictive personalities, we don't have one addiction. We have this addiction and that addiction and the other addiction. But the church has an answer for all of it. And it all comes back down to the word of God. Uh, everything can be healed out of here. I've, I've spent thousands of dollars on therapy and I've told my therapist this, but I like to talk to him because he does give me other insights. There's nothing he's going to do to fix me. What's going to fix me is my relationship with the man that wrote this book. They have all the tools. It's just they don't use them. I, I agree. You got you've got um, guide to life right there, and and the other guide, as you said, is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> well, what can the church uh, provide in the midst of our secular and godless culture? What can the church provide? We've talked a lot about it this morning, but. Anything else? That, uh, yeah, if a church is functioning the way it's supposed to, your community shouldn't have any needs. Um, Water of Life Community Church has uh, another aspect of them. It's called City Link. It's to feed the homeless. You know, um, that's another aspect of the church. If the church is functioning properly, your community is going to be stronger because you're reaching out and you're, you're finding those people who are broken and in need and you're trying to help them. And I think that's where one of the biggest things, if I have not charity, I am nothing. That's scriptural, right? Mm. And, so many of the churches are, like you said, they're more about how much can I get, how much can I get, and not about how much can I help others. Our church yeah. turns me around right and left. It, we don't ask for an offering. We have offering boxes for people to give their tithes and offerings to. And that money goes right back out to different mission fields to, to help people. Um, it, and that's the way it needs to be. Yeah, that's one thing that I'm, I'm excited about with promise keepers this year too is that a lot of guys don't know this yet because they haven't been there but um promise keepers has always had a focus on uh on building service projects having men work together in their community after the conference even before the conference a lot of times uh but but that's that is a an aspect of 
this year, even the simulcast host sites around the country, they're going to encourage the church that's hosting to you know, find service projects for these men to work together. Hopefully they come together from different churches and different denominations and from you know, not being churched at all. Uh, and then men can build relationships shoulder to shoulder, working together a lot quicker, a lot better, a lot more strongly, I think, than even face to face where we're, we're talking like, like we are here. Well, the consider this for this, this week is that the percentage of Americans who believe the church is influence, has influenced society in a positive way, it's about 85%. Percentage who believe that computers and technology have uh, influenced society in a positive way is 87%. So secular versus our, uh, even our godly um, perspective. When was this written? Really, um, again, I think about 90, early, mid 90s. Um, I would say that that number is way skewed. It's way off. <laughs> Yeah, copyright is 96. So I would say it's probably closer to about 95% on the secular side. And I imagine that we're probably only sitting at around maybe someplace between 35 and 40% on the other side of that. And, and that, that kind of, you know, there in most churches that you go to, you'll see a, a gender gap, mm -hmm. right? You'll see a lot more women than men. And I bet that has something to do with about the same. Yeah. Um, uh, percentages and, and yeah you're right it could be well below 50 percent that in today's society um what's been the church's impact on society yeah, we just that's kind of what we just talked about but specifically does the church um engage in schools and hospitals oh the government's not has taken that away and not allow doesn't allow that um I mean, look, I think at a hospital, you could have a, a priest that, you know, somebody calls for a priest for their last rites or whatever, but you just don't see that happening anymore like it was back even 30 years ago. Um, there used to be chapels in the, in the hospitals. Um, used to have prayer time at school, you know, just don't have, don't have that. I've seen some of that coming back, but it's really got torn away by the government. Kind of funny here in Florida, the largest chain of hospitals in the state is actually run by the Seventh Day Adventists. Yeah, I mean, you, you see so many hospitals. That's what they're named after: St. Luke's, you know, United Methodist Church Hospital. You know, it's like, but when you get in there, they don't have that. It doesn't seem like the board of directors has that um, biblical footing to. Uh, be able to stand strong and say no we, we're going to stand in our faith and we're going to treat our patients and our staff and our you know everybody biblically i know that's going on down here in houston right now that there's one group that they're being uh, it's it's a you uh, it's a methodist hospital but they're forcing the workers to be vaccinated and if they're not vaccinated they're fired and they've got a big lawsuit against them right now cool. Cool. And I think James, the root of your uh, questioning there was what is, what effect is the church having on the community? Mm -hmm. yeah, I believe, and and the the problem is is in the most cases it's not it's not having an effect on the community. It's a building that sits on the corner that people show up to on Sundays or Wednesdays. Um, that's that's the issue, uh, and and yes, I am so thankful. Praise God, my grandkids go to Redlands Christian School. You know, they get the word of God while they're getting their math and their English. I'm so thankful for that because they took it out of, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you say in the Pledge of Allegiance while you were in, you know, as you started your morning assemblies, people would say prayers. Uh, and when they took that away, that's when, you know, it's, it's just Satan separating. We talk about separation of church and state. Uh, we've been separated by so many different avenues, you know. I'm surprised that we still have in God we trust on our money. Trying um, to take it off. I know. They're trying to I take know. it out of the Constitution. They're trying to cancel it out of, out of everything in the government. And, and the only way that's going to be stopped is for the church to step up. And, you know. Uh, we are the church, brother. That's right. 
You were absolutely right. That was exactly where I was going. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people out there. And I think that, you know, James, that goes back to the other question about whether or not, why, why do men fall away? Because the church won't stand up. If, if we had leadership in the church that would stand up and say, no, this is wrong, and we're not going to tolerate this, I think a lot more men would stick around in church. You know, I'm, I want to brag on our pastor, Dan. Our pastor, Dan, went to the big shots in the state of California because they were going to pass that bill that, were, that uh, allowed uh, or, or kept churches from being able to try to heal the broken, uh, you know, with the, the homosexuality and the gay and um, the, it was going to be horrific, even to where they could become illegal to sell Bibles in the state of California. Our pastor went all the way up and got the bill rescinded. So that's what it's going to take. It takes pastors. I mean, he wasn't the only one in it, but he headed it up. There was other pastors from the area said, this is ridiculous um, because people see they're, they're so easy in, in, in the government to put these bills and laws out there that have good words on the top of them. But then when you get down into the, the nitty gritty of them, it's, it's doing nothing but destroying us. And our pastor and our elder board, they are all into that stuff and they look at what bills are being put out before the people of the state of California. And this is one of the, sorry, but this is one of the worst states there is for that kind of stuff. But our pastor will certainly step up and, and do it. And that's what we need. I they wish have we, everybody with them. I wish we had all the other pastors doing it so we could get the entire state flipped over because it's just ridiculous here how there's a lack of God in most of everything that happens around here. Yeah, did you, um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I shared with you guys my, uh, my, my, my God vision back in March of uh, 2020, um, March, April, when all the rioting and the looting and stuff and people were, you know, doing, going crazy in the streets and God told me, well, go out and march, march around those people like Jericho. And I'm like, God, I don't, I'm not. I'm not capable of doing that. I, I don't, I can't do that. And I didn't do it, but, um, but I did start praying. Um, I, I did start praying for those situations. And then I think some men across the country started praying about that. And, but you're right. The church itself was not visible. The church leaders, the, even Christians that, you know, we could have been, um, you know, surrounding those, those situations and 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 could be on our knees and people might think that's weakness but it's not um and you know, you know probably a lot of us a lot of a lot more of us would have uh been badly hurt or killed but the well, truth I mean, just wasn't the, the there cancel, at point. The, the cancel culture you know and the churches are scared of it it's like look what are you scared? Why are you scared of being canceled? Nobody can cancel you except for God, the person that you're supposed to be representing. And if these leaders, I mean, I think that, you know, look, a lot of these churches, there's a lot of problems. 501c3 corporations, they're, they're entities that are basically controlled by the government. I'm sorry. Government says you can't be in the government. You can't be involved in the government. If you are a Christian, you're going to be lambasted for it. But we're going to control you and your populations, because we're not going to give you those tax benefits if you uh, go against us. But at some point, the church has to be willing to stand up, and the people need to be willing to stand up and tell their leaders, no, we're not taking this anymore. We've got to get out there. Yeah. Um, so Dan, Dan, I think Dan had his hand up a minute ago. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. I was... Go ahead, Dan. Can't hear you, Dan. We're not getting, we can't hear you. You're off mute, but we still can't hear you. So um, as he's getting his, his mic on there. Um, okay, can you hear me Yeah, I can hear you. In the wrap up, um, I just ask that maybe each of us can go into the, the app and describe the church's impact on us. Because the church has had 
a positive impact on you, the church, God's church, maybe not the church that you're attending right now or a church that you've attended in the past, but God's church has had an impact on you. Maybe we could go in and, and, uh, and just let other guys have that, have that dialogue about yeah, the, I know. the body of Christ. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Dan. Okay. A couple of things that has come to my mind as we're talking. You know, these pastors, instead of go, go, you know, to these things, that's where us men need to stand up with these pastors and come up with them and help them if, as they need. Or, yes. or just come up and help them. Okay. Um, and second of all, as far as the, the seal, whatever stuff's going on with the good church, I mean, this is my take. I don't know why, but this guy, I've been thinking about this last week. People are talking about tax exemptions from the church, the tax and state and stuff. Well, what all started that? What happened? What happened if we broke away from that? And just not have the government invo involved at all in our in the church at all. What needs to happen? What we needs to happen? I think we did break away from that once. I think we created this United States of America, but we've gotten back to the the <laughs> like you said the the government is now controlling money going to the church and from the church and yeah it's a it's a, bit of a mess. Men have gotten involved again. I guess yeah. And that's the big problem because the churches are relying on the government to have the money, but if the church is doing what the church is supposed to as a body of Christ. And they don't have to worry about money because you're going to have the support from every member of the body of Christ. I've seen it work at water of life. And I know that we, there's probably tax breaks that we get too, but I have seen the congregation take care of the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Much better than welfare. Yeah. Right? yeah. Or meta, whatever. Um, so, uh, Promise 5. It used to be called a man in his church. Uh, we've recently, as we've re standing up Promise Keepers, uh, it was about change making, uh, making a change in our uh, society. And um, recently, our board of directors changed that one word moniker to serving. And uh, the Promise Keeper stand, uh, understands that Jesus calls him to be his hands and feet, serving others with integrity. He purposely, purposefully lifts up the leadership of the church and his nation in prayer. So it used to be just praying for your pastor and your church. And um, now we've, we've, we've included in this new PK era, praying for our leaders. So um, I think that's what I'd like us to get out of this is that, uh, you know, that we the body of Christ can have an impact on our society. Um, pray about things that are going on and listen as you're praying. It's not all about talking. Listen to what God has you to do and then go and do your best to be obedient. Um, I did my best to be obedient to marching around those guys, but I did it from my, my basement, my, my prayer, um, uh, my prayer war room, I guess, but I didn't put myself physically in any harm. Maybe I should have, um, but Hard to that, stand alone. I just, I just wasn't, call, I, I wasn't called to that except for when somebody was talking about Franklin Graham, Thomas, you were talking about Franklin Graham uh, leadership uh, that you're going to, you know, go through. Franklin Graham came to town. The return came to the Washington mall and we did March. We did stop at very significant, uh, places on the national mall and so you know maybe i should give myself just a little bit of credit because yeah, but it was like uh i mean it's like a, a huge christian party that day when we were having the return and you know very few people were having masks even though people walk around telling us to put our masks on but you know there wasn't any outbreak that came because of that um and there were uh all denominations, all um, races, all all different colors of people, I should say, uh, and it was beautiful. It was awesome. So, um, and that you know that was one of those things that was led by the um, Billy Graham Association. 
evangelistic system. They're lucky you weren't labeled an armed insurrection and arrested and charged. Yeah, them. it's amazing. It's amazing. Y'all were had Bibles. Those were weapons. Yeah. <laughs> you could have so, bashed one over the head with it. So in our response as a promise keeper, um, since I see the church in a fresh light, I will, what is your response? And I will encourage my pastor this week by um, maybe give some ideas in the app as well. That'd be so, I think, useful to guys that aren't here on our Zoom to, um, to see that in the app. And um, that would um, maybe encourage some other guys to maybe look at their church in a fresh light and, or I should say, look at the church in a fresh light, not just their church. Um, and, so and how they can support their pastor. It, it's pretty awesome that uh, this week, since you're talking about uplifting our pastors, uh, our pastor has a, an annual men's barbecue at his home. And um, that's coming this Thursday evening. And it's going to be awesome because I've been to every one for the last five, four years. Um, there's a gathering of about 300 men at the pastor's front yard. And he had feeds us good barbecue and baked beans and all that kind of stuff. But man, I'm telling you, the spiritual awakenings that happen there and just the feeling of the Holy Spirit that's there is amazing. And so I'm looking for a good week. We got the Tony Evans Kingdom Men Rising this weekend and, you know, all kind of stuff going on. It's like, um, praise God, you know, we have to learn to love. That's the biggest thing. Uh, and what I'm seeing in this in this whole app here with PK is, is brothers starting to love each other. And we're all broken. So just because you're broken don't mean you got to stay hidden. That's what we're here for is for love. And as we start to love, then we can start flowing that out into our church and into our communities and, and trying to do what we're supposed to be doing, you know. <laughs> Got to support yeah. you. I'd also encourage you to, to read Acts 2, Acts chapter 2. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, we, I know my church is focused um, some time on becoming an Acts 2 church. So, um, you know, what should the church look like? Um, it, it's a lot different than our institutions that we have today, uh, at least in biblical times. Um, well, we're coming, we're I think a little past our time, but um, is, I just ask, uh, and you guys can stay around if you have time, but somebody pray us out, and uh, if you need to go, you can go, and if you want to stick around for another couple of minutes or so, um, we can certainly talk. I'd like to talk, make sure uh, we're doing the right study for next week. I've got one kind of in my mind, but uh, you guys can modify that. I'll pray us out. Thank you, Christopher. Oh, God. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time together today to discuss your word. Give us strength to stand strong in our faith. Let us be servant leaders by being leading servants. Let us know, you know help us to understand that the most important thing that we can do in our days is by sharing you with others I believe that there is an awakening happening and more and more men are going to stand strong in you Lord just continue to give all of us the strength and keep us under your umbrella of grace Lord pray this in your mighty name amen 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 God bless right, you guys that have to go. Appreciate you, you Carl. See you later, Carl. God bless. Okay. Chat. All right. So next week we want to talk about uh, one of the um, studies in part four that's going from third to home, perf um, performing together, working together, living life together as uh, as brothers in Christ. And there's um, you know, one one of the first couple of sessions is focused on man and his friends. Is there any particular promise 
that you guys would like to do next? Maybe that's the first way to way to go. Because we've been we've touched on the church, we've touched on unity, and we've touched on uh, becoming brothers or brotherhood. Uh, do you want a different promise, or do you want to maybe stick with this one on the church? I think um, another on brotherhood or something else. I think. Um family um i don't something something about family family okay. relationships there i'm not sure which promise Maybe that promise is if that's five. is that promise five also promise i'm sorry promise four six i thought it was six it's prom, promise four is promise uh, four. marriage and family yeah marriage and family promise four yeah. i mean that that's what you know we haven't touched on that one okay. anybody else Oh. voting because I'm going to go to the Tony Evans thing next Saturday at nine. These guys. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we we didn't mention that a couple of times. Um, you know, the also bring up the the leadership summit. Um, that starts the, at noon. Yeah, the, it won't be released until noon, and I think the uh, at least on the East Coast, I think the Tony Evans does it. I don't know if it starts at nine. On the East Coast, or that's Central, since he's Sorry, nine, 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 central. nine Central. I think nine. it's Central. So, uh, uh, yeah. the Leadership Summit—it's a one-hour video, and you're going to have a ten-day challenge after that. Uh, it can be done anytime after noon on Saturday. Oh, okay. um, so it can be done on Sunday or Monday or or whatever okay. um, works. Five works in your hours. Schedule. We have you guys at nine. Have Tony Evans from ten to one. And I watched the PK thing from one to two. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was looking at five well, hours straight. I want to take a break for, for lunch or something. And, uh, Talk but, about drinking from a fire hose. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that gets it. I wanted to go to the Tony Evans one too. And I'm not sure. Do you have to sign up for that or you just show up? Yeah. You have to sign up. You have to register. Okay. I may, I may have to look at that, but I need help. So I'll, uh, I'll me... send you, I'll, I'll get with you in the app. I'll send you the link. All right, thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Chris. All right, so um, yeah, so we'll still meet next week. Um, <laughs> there's your sixth hour, Chris. We might um, just have to um, jump uh, jump off a few minutes early, not run, let this run over next week. Yeah. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And you guys will you guys will help make that happen, I'm sure. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. My reminder will be popping up on my computer screen saying, hey, you got to get to this one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to stop the recording right now. and We can stay on for a bit if, you need, if anybody needs any extra prayer. I'll be here to pray with you. Thanks, brothers. <laughs>